I have to begin by telling you a little secret about myself. I just love to watch people. I, I just love it, right? So I have to tell you about one of the favoriteest people who I've ever watched. Now, this was when I was working down in Antarctica. And this guy, he was the best mimic I've ever met in my life. He could mimic almost anybody. He was just this thin, wispy little guy with this, you know, kind of a big head. So he looked like this sort of upside down exclamation point. And so well, he had this light sort of voice. Now the station manager, on the other hand, was this gigantic man. He was very, very tall, had a deep baritone voice. And what and Neil, the little guy, used to like to do is he liked to pick up the phone and he'd say, in a perfect imitation of the station manager, Art Brown's voice, he'd say, hello, this is Art Brown speaking. So one day the phone rings, Neil picks it up, says, hello, this is Art Brown speaking. And it was Art Brown on the other end of the line. <laughs> and so Art says, who the hell is this? And Neil says, why Art? This is you. <laughs> I'm so glad you've finally gotten in touch with yourself. <laughs> and so that's what I'm going to help you do here today, is to, to get more in touch with one of the deepest attributes you have as a human being, and that is your ability to learn. Now, I should probably give you just a little bit more insight into my own background. I grew up moving all over the United States. So that by the time I was about 15 years old, I'd lived in 10 different places. Now, the thing is, mathematics is very sequential. So if you fall off anywhere along the way, it's very hard to get back on. Well, I was about seven years old when we moved from Texas to Massachusetts, and suddenly they were way far ahead of me in the multiplication tables. Well, I realized at that time there, there was just no way I could catch up. And in fact, I just gave it up. I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science, which is kind of ironic since I'm speaking with you here today as a professor of engineering. <laughs> and I'm the real deal. I publish in very good journals. I'm a pro licensed professional engineer. And so one day, one of my students sort of found out about my bad past as a, a math flunky. And he asked me, how did you do it? How did you change your brain? And I thought about it. I, I thought, uh, I mean, here I was, like, like this, is, this is the last cute picture of me, right? <laughs> so I was just this little kid, and I loved animals, and I loved kind of fluffy things. I liked knitting, and, and I, I, always, I always thought, wouldn't it be really cool, since I can't do math and science, maybe I could learn another language. I mean, I grew up in a resolutely monolingual household, and you can guess what language we spoke, and I thought, oh, it'd be so cool if I could ever just learn another language. So at that time, there were not college loans available. And so I just thought, how can I, how can I do it? I can't afford to go to college. There was one way to do it and actually get paid to learn another language. And that was to join the Army. <laughs> so uh, at age 18, uh, right out of high school, I joined the, the Army, and that's me looking super nervous, about to throw a hand grenade, and if you knew how clumsy I am, you would know why I look so incredibly nervous. <laughs> but I did learn another language. I learned Russian, more or less at random. I picked that language. I ended up on Russian Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea. And I, I just loved having new adventures and seeing the world through new perspectives. So I also ended up in Antarctica, uh, at the South Pole Station, and that's where I met my husband, Philip. Uh, at, at, so I always say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man. And, uh, and he is right here today, 
So I, I'm so, uh, he, we've been married for 32 years. And so uh, that was the smartest move I ever made was to say yes to that man. So, so the thing is, I, uh, I, here I was, 26 years old. I, w I was in the army. I decided I wanted to leave the army and go back into the civilian world. But suddenly, a stark reality faced me. I had, as I discovered, only one professional expertise, and that was the ability to speak Russian. And guess what? <laughs> Nobody wants to hire people just because they speak Russian, right? There's very few job opportunities. So I, that led me to reflect very carefully on what career direction I was going in. And I thought back, and I worked with all these West Point engineers, and I'd open their books sometimes and look at, look at these equations that they looked kind of like a foreign language, right? And I thought, now wait a minute, aren't I supposed to be open to new adventures, new perspectives? If, if, I'm, if I'm that open, why don't I try to see if I can have a new intellectual adventure and see if I can learn math and science. Not only would it be a challenge, but it actually could open some career doors for me. Because after all, we know that language and culture are incredibly important. But in today's society, math and science and technology are also of increasing importance. So at age 26, I was just got out of the army, I decided to try to change my brain. And it was not easy. But if I'd known then what I know now, I could have made it much easier on myself. So back as I tried to uh, answer that student's question, how did you change your brain? I began, yeah, I thought about it, and I thought, you know, I like to write books. Why don't I write a book about this? And so I began researching. I wrote up a manuscript, and uh, I reached out, actually, to thousands of the top teaching professors and researchers in, in STEM professions uh, in the English-speaking world, and I asked them, would you read my manuscript? And to my surprise, shocking percentages of them uh, agreed to do this. So I sent them my manuscript, and one thing, uh, they, uh, I, I got a lot of great information back, but one thing shocked me. They, they often had this sort of secret shared handshake. They did sort of the same things, but they didn't really talk to other professors about what they did. And what those same things were was they often taught using metaphor and analogy to, to convey very, very difficult ideas in math and science. So for example, if you have the idea in calculus of a limit, there's all these equations that relate to the idea of a limit. Uh, but you can also think of it as there's a stalker who's getting closer and closer, but never quite touching, right? If you actually have that in the back of your mind as you're starting to look at the equations, the equations can make sense for you much more quickly. So these professors often didn't like to share that they use metaphor and analogy in their teaching because other professors would be like, you're dumbing down the material. What those other professors didn't understand was you can more rapidly onboard people into the information you're trying to convey by using metaphor and analogy. In fact, there's a, a theory called neural reuse theory that actually reveals that we use the same neural circuits to understand the metaphor as we do to understand the in-depth underlying concept. And so that's why metaphors can be so effective at getting you on board with the ideas more quickly. So, so I also I reached out to top cognitive uh, psychologists, top neuroscientists, spoke with them. How do we learn effectively? I myself have studied and uh, done research, not only in engineering, but in engineering education and education in STEM for several decades. So what I want to share with you here today is some of the best of what I found about how we learn effectively. 
Now, the brain, as we know, is enormously complicated. But fortunately, we can simplify its operation into two fundamentally different modes. The first, I'll call the focused mode. And uh, psychologists might term it task positive networks. It's basically when you're looking at me or looking at a book and you're focusing, it's like a flashlight. You turn on this mode of thinking and it is a specific set of neural circuits. Now there's another completely different set of neural circuits and I'll call this the diffuse mode. And what it really is, is a set of maybe a couple of dozen different neural resting states, the most prominent of which is the default mode network. So diffuse mode isn't like focus mode. Focus mode, you turn your attention to something and it's on. Diffuse mode is no attention on anything. You're just sort of relaxing whatever kind of thoughts come to your mind. You're not directing your thoughts. So it might be something like you're, you're standing in the shower or you're going for a, a drive, sitting on a bus, going for a walk, something like that. So it, that's, uh, those are the kinds of times when diffuse mode might spontaneously arise. Now to better understand the difference between focused and diffuse mode is we'll use a metaphor. And the metaphor we're going to use is that of a pinball machine. Now a pinball machine, it works. They're old devices. You pull back on a plunger and a ball goes boinking out on this, these rubber bumpers and that's how you get points. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that pinball machine and we're going to put it right on the human brain. Here you see the little ears and the eye, or the nose on top, and there's the brain right there. Okay, are you ready for it? Okay, here we go, okay. So there's the pinball on the brain. And notice how close together these rubber bumpers are. This is an analogy for the focused mode. Now what happens in focused mode is you often have patterns that you've laid in there related to things you already know how to do. So for example, let's say you know how to do multiplication. You've got some patterns related to multiplication. And then when you think a thought, like let's say I said multiply 22 times 23. You get out a pencil and paper and you multiply and it would move along the lines mentally, uh, those pathways that you've already laid because you already know how to do multiplication. But let's say, you know how to do multiplication, but you've never experienced division before. So you don't know how to do division. It's almost like there's a pattern that will be there in some other part of your brain, but how do you even get to the pattern that will be division? You don't know what it's shaped like, you don't know what it feels like, what it looks like, how to get there. How do you get there? So what often happens, you know multiplication, you sit down, you start to do a, a division problem, and you start from here because you're used to multiplication. And guess what? It doesn't work, right? Because you're doing the wrong technique and you're using the wrong patterns. And so you try harder and harder to figure out what's going on. You get more and more frustrated. And finally, you shut the book and you walk away. And when that happens, you've got your attention off of that, that problem, and that opens up this different mode of thinking, the diffuse mode. And in this mode, you think a thought and it ranges much more widely and randomly. So you can't actually solve a problem in the diffuse mode, but you can at least get to the new place you need to be in order to begin working at a new idea or understanding a new concept. So learning, as it turns out, often involves going back and forth between focused and diffuse modes. You can be in only one mode at a time, right? So you can either be in focus mode or diffuse mode, but not both unless you are taking certain forms of mushrooms, which I don't recommend in this talk, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, 
So, so what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to uh, uh, team up. So meet someone who is sitting close to or behind you. I'd like you to meet someone new if you possibly could. Introduce yourselves. And then what I'd like you to do is we've just gone over the difference between focused and diffuse modes. And so I, I'd like you to explain to one another, take about two minutes and explain to one another what is the difference between focused and diffuse modes. So on your mark, get set, go. Okay. So notice, for those of you who are students, or especially for those of you who are teachers, notice what we did there was we just took a little tiny break and you turned your attention from me to the people beside you. That actually gave you a little diffuse mode break and it allowed you to understand the material in a little bit of a better way. So this kind of thing is really important. This is part of why active learning, taking breaks where you actively think about the, the material that you're trying to learn or trying to teach can be very, very helpful. But I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking back and forth for learning new material. Who has time for that? Especially because I and the students I know like to procrastinate. <laughs> Procrastination is actually a huge deal in learning. And, and so it's so important that I want to spend just a minute or two speaking about it. So as it turns out, when you even think, just think about something you don't want to do or you don't like, it activates a portion of the brain that experiences pain. So the brain, naturally enough, just switches its attention and you instantly feel better, right? So here's the process. Procrastination is just a habit, right? So we kind of fall into, oh, wait a minute. I feel a little bit uncomfortable because I'm thinking about something I don't want to do. So I turn my attention to something more pleasant and the result is that I feel happier almost instantly. Now, you do this once, you do it twice, it's no big deal at all. You do it very often, however, and it is procrastination, and it can have serious negative long-term consequences on your life. So because I'm an engineer, I just want to cut to the chase. So how do you deal with procrastination? Now, as, as Karen had mentioned, I teach, uh, along with Karen Sanowski, the, the world's largest massive open online course, and it is um, the one thing that they absolutely love is what I'm going to tell you about next. They love learning about focused and diffuse. They love learning about chunking, uh, which you'll learn about later. And they love learning about the Pomodoro technique, which is what I'm going to teach you about. Has anyone here heard of the Pomodoro technique? If you have, raise your hand, let me see. Okay, a fair number, yay! I no wonder Universidad Francisco Marroquín is so advanced, right? Uh, so, so I'm just going to give you a quick review, or for those of you who don't know it, this is a great, great technique. So it, Pomodoro is Italian for tomato, and it was developed uh, by an Italian, Francesco Cidillo, in the 1980s. And so all you have to do for this technique is you turn off all distractions, so cell phone goes off or it, it, no alarms, nothing like that. Your computer, all those little instant messages that pop off, uh, those have to go off as well. And then you just set a timer for 25 minutes. This can be any timer. So for me, I download a, uh, a little timer that I use on my desktop, my last laptop. Some people like to use Pomodoro timer apps. Um, and some of these apps are very sophisticated. So you can do maybe a couple Pomodoros on one subject and a couple on another during a day and they kind of collect little badges for how many Pomodoros they do. And, but uh, once you've set the timer for 25 minutes, you just focus as intently as you can 
for 25 minutes. Now, this does not mean you focus perfectly for 25 minutes because people's minds don't work that way. We're kind of monkey mind, right? Uh, a lot of random thoughts can come uh, around. For me, for example, I may work for five minutes on a Pomodoro, I'll look at the timer, and there's 20 minutes left. So I, I, I'm like, I can't do it, I can't do 20 more minutes. And I let that thought just go right on by, and then I return my focus to the work, and the reality is anybody can do 25 minutes. The main thing is, when you're done with those 25 minutes, you give yourself a little reward. So a cup of coffee, a, listen to a favorite song you like, talk with friends, go on Facebook, whatever floats your boat that comfortably distracts your attention, changes your attention. Now remember, we always used to think that learning only took place when you were focusing. But now we understand that learning continues to take place in the diffuse mode. So if you are using this little bit of reward time, which you need to do, that's a time when learning is continuing to take place. So it's a very important thing to do as part of your, your study routine. So what, what the Pomodoro is doing, in essence, is it's helping to build, just like working out helps build your muscles, the Pomodoro technique helps get you practice with focusing intently for a little while. Also gives you a little practice in relaxing. And it's building focusing abilities, so it actually can enhance your ability to learn the more you do the Pomodoro technique. And it also enhances your ability to be creative the more you relax afterwards and, and sort of do something that gives yourself a reward. The only other little bit of advice I have for you is do not focus on finishing a task when you're doing a Pomodoro. So you don't want to sit and think, I'm going to finish my entire homework during this Pomodoro session. No, that activates the pain in your brain. You just sit and think, I'm doing 25 minutes. However much I get done in 25 minutes, that's what I'm going to do. And you don't even think about the topic you're going to work on. You just do it. And that tricks your brain to avoid the pain in your brain that can arise when you're thinking about something you don't want to do. Now, learning is a lot like baking a cake. So a, a cake has lots of different ingredients to it. And so learning has lots of different ingredients that are very important in, in helping you be effective in the long run. And one of those ingredients is sleep. And I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I knew that, right? You're not telling us anything new. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why sleep is important. And that will help you to know why you should do it. I mean, I've seen doctoral students coming up for a doctoral exam and for the qualifying exam to become a doctor. And they actually didn't sleep the night before. These are highly intelligent people who didn't understand that sleep is, is very, very important for learning. So if you understand why, that can help motivate you to try to get a better sleep when you need to. So if you look here, these are my metaphors for neurons. So these little circles are neurons. And during the day, when, you, when you're thinking away and working on things, what happens is these little metabolites come out of the neurons. And they come out and they're stuck. We've got cerebral fluid that slowly goes by, but these big neurons are kind of like boulders and they block the flow of the fluids. So, so, so what happens? It turns out that when you go to sleep, your brain cells shrink, right? So I love this part, so I'm going to do it again. Okay, so there we go. Oh, when you go to sleep, your, your brain cells shrink, and that allows the, the fluids to wash those toxins away. So part of why sleep is important is because it cleans your brain. But it's important as well for another reason altogether. This is an incredible new technique called light microscopy, and it allows you to 
image living neurons. So these neurons, this neuron right here, this is a neuron that's been imaged before learning and before sleep. And this is the exact same neuron imaged after learning and after sleep. Look at these little yellow triangles. Those triangles indicate places where new synoptic connections are formed. Those are the connections with other neurons that are actually the foundation of new learning. So sleep isn't just like you go to sleep, it's all mush, you wake up and it's all mush. Sleep is when you, 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 you go to sleep and you wake up and you have this sort of neural upgrade, which is, you know, it's like a better deal than you get from Microsoft. So, uh, uh, but, so this is why you can only grow so many synoptic connections in an evening. And this is why it's very important to space your learning out. You want to grow more and more synoptic connections. So you want to learn something, uh, learn the pattern one day, then the next day a repetition of that pattern, then maybe the next day another repetition, slightly different. And with that, you're growing a, a nice solid set uh, or not a solid neural pattern that is the foundation of good learning. If you don't do this, if you do something like you cram every night, or I mean you cram the night before the exam, it makes it a lot easier for your little sort of metabolic vampires to suck those slim, uh, very small patterns away. So metaphorically speaking, it's kind of like this. When you're learning, you lay bricks, lay mortar, and allow time to, for that mortar to dry between the layers. If you don't do that, you get something that looks like sort of a, a jumbled mess of neurons. Um, so so this, is, this is one of the good ingredients of good learning. But there's another one, and that is exercise. Now, if you look here, well, we used to think that you were born with all the neurons you'd ever have, and then you kind of, as you got older, they'd start dying off and get dumber as you got older, and then you die, and it was pretty depressing. So fortunately, it was all completely wrong. Now we know that new neurons are being born every day, particularly in the hippocampus, which is very important for learning and memory. So this mouse, for example, is being taught to differentiate between these two patterns. And these are, these sort of blue blobs are old neurons. The red streaks are new neurons. What they found was when the mouse is allowed to exercise, there's lots more new neurons that are born and the mouse learns much more quickly. Now this is an older study and so the, um, uh, there, there's been so much that, that has allowed us to understand that exactly the same phenomenon exists in people. And the reason I'm study, showing you this particular study is because one of the co-authors on this important paper, which was one of the very first to illustrate the importance of, of exercise in learning, was, uh, was Terence Sinowski. And Terence Sinowski is my co-instructor in the Massive Open Online course, Learning How to Learn. So when we went out to film uh, uh, Learning How to Learn, Terry is, he is a living legend of a neuroscientist. So he's, you know, one of only 10 living human beings who's in it, all three of the U.S. National Academies. So I'm always, like, really nervous when I go to meet Terry. Uh, and, but I couldn't help it. So we get together, and I'm like, you know, Terry's talking about the importance of exercise. So I'm like, okay, well, Terry, tell me. So do you exercise? And Terry's like, do I exercise? Do I exercise? Well, so next thing I know, this guy who's, who's 68 years old, he goes scrambling down those 400 foot, you know, they're like a 100 meter cliff, and, and off he goes, every other day or so, he's down on the beach going for a run. I, I love how this ends up here. Yay! You know? So, uh, so uh, 
the thing is, I'm convinced that part of the reason that Terry is such a, a legendary neuroscientist is that he walks the walk. He actually takes the results that we're getting from neuroscience to enhance his own everyday life, and you can do that too. Now, there's, so let's switch topics just a little bit because there are so many topics that are relevant to learning. And let's talk just a little bit about memory. Now, memory is, for purposes of our talk, we're only going to talk about long-term memory and short-term or working memory. Now, we used to think that there were seven sort of slots in working memory, and, and that meant you could maybe hold seven numbers temporarily in your mind. Now we think it's more like four slots in working memory. In other words, you can hold maybe four numbers in mind. Uh, if I haven't had my coffee yet, it's more like two numbers in mind, if I'm lucky, right? But, but the, the working memory is in the prefrontal cortex. And you can actually see the prefrontal cortex when it's holding something and working in working memory. It, it's working. You can see a lot of metabolic processes occurring there. So in some sense, what you can imagine metaphorically is when you focus on something, it's a little bit like you, you have this octopus of attention and it reaches through those slots of working memory and makes connections to long-term memory. So what happens if you're sitting there and you're working on your homework and you also have some television going on on the side? It's almost as if it takes some of that working memory up. And in a very real sense, you're not as intelligent while you're focusing on the material. So this is why it's important to try to, to focus as much as you reasonably can without distractions, because then you're, you're making progress much more quickly. Sometimes students will come up to me and say, you know, I spent 10 hours focusing, you know, studying uh, yesterday. I don't understand how I flunked the test, right? And then you want to say, well, 10 hours cramming the day before? Really? Come on. And then when you talk to them, it's like, well, it was 10 hours, but they were talking with their friends some and listening to the radio and so forth. So it wasn't really 10 hours as they, they kind of led you to believe. So this is, this is, again, is part of why you want to be very careful with focusing as intently as you can. And if you're a professor and a student comes to you and they are having problems with their, their tests and so forth and are not doing well in the class, you want to be asking, what are they really doing as far as their studies? I had a student come up to me once and say, he showed me his test, it was all covered with red stuff, and he'd flunked it. And he said, I just don't understand how I could have flunked this test. I mean, I understood it when you said it in class. I mean, he really thought that if he, we, have, we have raised this gold standard of understanding is the sole important thing for learning, and that's wrong. You can kind of get a glimmer of things and sort of understand it, but until you practice and repeat, you do not understand it. So that's part of why practice and repetition can be so incredibly important. Now here's another, uh, just by contrast, this shows the diffuse mode, and you can see it's a very random uh, set of connections. No, octopus of attention that's controlling things. Now, how do you get things from working memory down into long-term memory? And this is where practice helps make permanent, right? You, what happens when you're learning something is you're developing these sort of little neural patterns, and it's kind of like this. You practice a little bit, and then you practice more, and it gets, those patterns get deeper and richer with your, with your enhanced practice. So this leads us to the idea of chunking. And chunking is one of the most important ideas of all of this talk. Now, what is chunking? If you look at something like a puzzle and you're trying to figure that puzzle out, and what's happening is, 
that puzzle or if it's an equation that you're trying to use, you're trying to solve a problem, you're trying to understand a concept, your working memory is going a little crazy. And you can see it in neural imaging that your working memory is working really hard. But once you figure that concept out, once you, you practice with it and so it's easy to understand it and you've got it, it's kind of like you've got the pattern down, it's chunked, and you have in some sense, instead of this kind of wild mad pattern, you now have this smooth ribbon that you can pull into working memory and here's the important part. Those other slots of working memory are free. So if you really understand something, you can pull it up in working memory and then you can make connections with new things. And so this, is, again, is why not only understanding but also practice and repetition is really important. What's interesting is when you don't understand something, you're, you're, your brain is working really hard but when you've understood and practiced and sort of developed these newer neural chunks, your prefrontal cortex settles down. It relaxes. It isn't working as hard to do the same sorts of problems because you have these chunks that you can just draw up into working memory. Now, occasionally, I'll have students come up to me and say, I suffer from test anxiety. I, I, I just, whenever I look at a test, I do really badly because of the anxiety. Well, I do a lot of active learning in my classes. And one thing I found is this. Very frequently, students who, who come up and say, I suffer from test anxiety, are their, their uh, teammates will often say of them, they don't actually study at all. They never come with our group. They never do the homework with us. They're not very active participants. The reason they suffer from test anxiety is when they sit down and they start to do the test, guess what? That's the first time they've really looked at the problem and understood that they don't understand it. So of course, their brain is in this mode, and of course they, they feel very anxious. It's because they haven't gotten the practice they need to get to this kind of mode. So what you're doing with learning is kind of developing this, this set of library of chunks. Now, if you look here, this is, this is our daughter, Rachel. So you might ask, what well, one thing is, so we made this massive open online course, Learning How to Learn, and we did it in our basement, my husband's in our basement, and, and um, we did it for less than $5,000. So you might think, I mean, like compared with Harvard where they spend millions of dollars on MOOCs and so forth, we did it for nothing. Now, how did we do it so cheaply? It's because whenever I needed like a bit part for someone to be an actress in the MOOC, I could just go to our daughters and say, hey, would you do this, right? So I needed somebody to model backing up a car really super badly. And so I asked our two daughters, and my younger daughter says, Mom, I can do that, right? And so what she's doing is she's modeling. Remember that part where the, the working memory is going crazy? That's what it feels like when you're first learning to back up a car. So if you watch her, you'll see she's modeling what it's like when you're first learning to back up a car. It is, it's really kind of scary almost. Do you look at this mirror? Do you look at this mirror? Do you turn around? What do you do? And so look at her little face there. You can see she's totally confused. Wait, no, do I go this way? Which way? No. No, no, I don't go this way. Uh, how about that way? Uh, no, and then off she goes to the ditch. So, so the thing is, backing up a car, once you, when you first start, your working memory is going crazy. But when you learn it, once you've learned to back up a car, it is so easy. You just draw that. You think the thought, I'm going to back up the car. You've drawn it up into one slot of working memory. With other slots, you can talk to your friends, listen to the radio, it, and it's, it's easy. So just like backing up a car is creates, learning to do that is one neural chunk, it, when you're learning language, for example, you're learning to conjugate a verb, you're learning various neural chunks, 
you're learning to put together in working memory different words in the new language that you're learning. And it's the same if you're learning dance, you're learning new neural chunks, if you're learning to play a musical instrument, if you're learning in math and science, you're learning to, to practice and, and have well-practiced chunks that you can draw together in mind. So it's basically any kind of expertise invol involves the, the development of neural chunks, neural patterns, and the more and the deeper and the richer they are, the, the, the better your sense of expertise. Now, one thing about learning is this. We often think that some of our, our best traits are bad traits. So, for example, we often think that a poor memory is a really bad trait. But I'm here to tell you that having a poor memory is actually a good trait. So how can that be? It turns out, remember those four slots of working memory? So some people have steel trap minds. They can really hold something in memory, right? And they can do somersaults with it. I mean, you can tell them all sorts of things. They can put it all together and, and spit it back out at you. And they are, they're really, really smart that way. Other people, they got those four slots of working memory and, you know, you tell them some stuff and they're, ooh, shiny. You know, they get distracted and, and something falls out. So they can't hold things in memory very easily. But it turns out that if something falls out of working memory, something else comes in. In fact, people like this, as research has shown, are more creative. And so if you, as it turns out, if you have this kind of poor working memory, you are in all probability more creative. Does it mean you have to work a little harder and longer in order to try to keep up with some of the people with steel trap minds? Yes, it does. But you wouldn't want to trade it because that, that creativity is a powerful, powerful asset. Now, another uh, uh, sort of... Uh, trait of thinking that people sometimes think is very bad is they'll, they think that they're slow thinkers and that that's a bad thing. Now, there are, for when I'm in teaching in class, I, sometimes I'll ask a question, and before the last word is out of my mouth, even though it's an advanced problem in Bayes' theorem or something, th there's some student in the front who's got his hand up, he, he's already ready to answer. I mean, some people are really fast that way. It's like they have these brains that are race car brains. They get there very, very quickly. Other people have more like hiker brains, right? They're walkers. And they, they can get there, but not as quickly. Not as quickly at all. But think about what the hiker, the walker experiences. They, they can look out. They see the pine trees. They can see the little rabbit paths. They smell the pine in the air. They hear the birds. A completely different experience from the race car driver, and in some ways, far richer and deeper. My hero in science is a man named Santiago Ramon y Cajal, and he won the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work in neuroscience. He's known as the father of modern neuroscience. And he wrote a autobiography in which he revealed some very interesting thoughts. He said, I have worked with many geniuses, geniuses, incidentally, who did not win the Nobel Prize. And he said, I am no genius. He said, the w reason I got to where I am is that I am persistent, and I'm flexible in the face of data that tells me I need to change my thinking, that I was wrong. He said, the geniuses that I've worked with are so smart that they're used to always being right. And when the data comes back and it tells them they were wrong, they're not used to it. And they can't flexibly change their mind. In fact, they're very used to jumping to conclusions and being unable to change their minds when they're incorrect. So if you are a slower thinker, rejoice. There is still room for you to do creative 
and worthwhile work that benefits all of society. This woman here, Miriam Mirzakhani, won the Fields Medal, which is sort of like the Nobel Prize for mathematicians. She was told as a young woman that she thought too slowly to be a mathematician, but she's now acknowledged as one of the most creative mathematicians alive. Now, as we're wrapping up here, I want to just for a moment allude to illusions of competence in learning. We all fool ourselves about how, uh, how well we're learning. When we have material open in front of us, we think we know it. You shut it, and suddenly you find out you don't know it. And so how can you get away from some of the, these tricks, these um, illusions that your brain uh, plays on yourself when you're not actually learning something? The best way, one of the best ways to avoid illusions of competence in learning is tests. So as a teacher, what this means is test your students every chance you get. For my class, for example, I don't give midterms. I give a quiz nearly every week. And so what that does is prevents procrastination, but it also makes students acknowledge right away if they don't understand the material or they're not keeping up in the material. So uh, one thing is try to, we've often got this feeling what, like we don't need to memorize certain equations. Now I'm not sure if that's the case in Guatemala with uh, science, technology, engineering, and math education, but in the United States, sometimes we're like, you don't need to memorize an equation, you can look it up. This is a bad idea. A little bit of memorization goes a long way. It's a valuable tool. For many millennia, we thought that uh, memorization was the only, uh, that's the only way people learned. And so memorization was thought to be the bastion of all learning, right? And then about 100 years ago, the pendulum started sw swinging the other way. We thought, you know, it's not memorization that's important, it's understanding that's important. And so we said, memorization isn't important at all. Now we're beginning to realize that some degree of memorization is crucial for you to really understand the material. So, Poets will sometimes say things like, oh, memorize the poem, and you will understand it more deeply. But in, in mathematics, why should we let all the poets have the fun, right? Uh, a little memorization of equations can actually help solidify key ideas. And using flashcards, even for equations, is valuable. So it's not just language study, not just things like uh, um, anatomy, but also in math and science. And if you take one thing away from this talk, I would like it to be the idea of recall. Recall is a very simple technique. If you're trying to learn something very difficult from a book, what you do with this technique is you read the page as carefully as you can, then you look away and see what you can recall. So, I mean, it's so easy, so simple sounding that it's like, could that really work? But I mean, our own tendency is, well, you underline, right? Or, or yellow highlight, because when you're moving that pen on the page, it clearly is going into your brain, right? Actually, it fools you, it's not going into your brain. So, in fact, by comparison, recall is far better in a study that was published in Science Magazine, or Science Journal, incidentally. Recall is better than uh, the underlining, rereading, or concept mapping. It's one of the best techniques that's out there. So I, I strongly recommend recall. Now, in closing, I would like to allude to the idea of passion. Passion, we're often sort of recommended to follow our passions. But passion is a double-edged sword. Passions develop about what we're good at. And some things take much longer to get good at. So I always say, don't just follow your passions. Broaden your passions, and your lives will be greatly enriched. Thank you so much.